So, Dan, let's think about the role of coaching. So, in, in your opinion, what role did coaching play and what did it actually bring? What did it contribute to the process, do you think? Okay, so um, it's probably best to start with the, the words we see on the screen there, actually. I, I tried to get some feedback from the participants at the end um, just to see what they thought about coaching within the unseen observation model. Uh, and, and some of those words were really really wonderful actually and really heartening to see um what i liked about it was that there people mentioned words like challenging and thought provoking because you know coaching isn't isn't about necessarily lying down on a couch with a, a nice yeah. shaded lamp and stuff it, it yeah. can be challenging it can be thought provoking but in a positive and supportive way and i think that's the key um no one's under the spotlight it's about feeling comfortable to do your your best thinking um yeah. as Christian van Neuberg would say, trying to yeah. think carefully about what it is you're looking at. Uh, so I like that combination of words, you know, supportive, challenging, thought provoking and motivating, you know, because yeah. uh, I think good coaching is, does provide energy for people. And I, I think those words help to reflect that. So that was really lovely to see for sure. Um, so yeah, that would be my starting point. In terms of the, the skills and, and what they did in terms of the pilot, I, I think, as we sort of mentioned previously, there were there were three coaching points within the model for us, and that the first one was around um, when people were trying to clarify what it was they want to look at, and and if you've got a really skilled coach or or a, someone who's prepared to help the coachee think through that carefully, you can really draw out something really specific that they want to focus on, and I think that was really important because that in itself is really motivational. Uh, and that helps to build trust and that helps to feel people for feel supported, for example. So that was really important. In, in the second coaching meeting, it was a different style, really. It was more about looking at that lesson plan and, and thinking about what are the assumptions we're making about our teaching and, you know, well, how did professional learning and, and the books we've read influence what we're going to do in this lesson and how we're going to teach people? So that was a, a different focus in the coaching, really, with some different thinking behind that. But again, really, really useful. And, and possibly that's the most challenging bit um, when you've you've drawn up a plan and then someone's getting you to really reflect on how that is and how that works. That can be quite difficult because teachers are, you know, they're quite precious about their lessons and the way they work. And it's and you've got to tread carefully there, but equally help people to reflect. Then that last coaching meeting is really a kind of opportunity to think about the successes they've had and how they can share that. And, and I like the question, you know, if you could do this all again, you know, what would you do differently? Um, and, and, um, and, and as I said earlier, I think people sometimes have their best insights when they step away from the actual meetings themselves. So to have, to have that final meeting together as a group at the end, that was really good to kind of draw those insights together. I think that was important. Can I ask for the, sc the scaffolding of the coaching? Were there were there question prompts? Were there particular models you used? Or was it really trusting the coaches to just come up with questions on the spot and you'd given just direction about the theme of the meeting, if you like? So how much scaffolding support or material was given? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I think, I, think, I think the model would be hard to do without some knowledge of coaching. And if you want to do it well... So I think it's useful if there is some basic uh, coaching experience within there. Um, luckily, that all the participants I have worked with so far, they have some basic skills and some knowledge. And there was one chap who didn't, so I made sure there was some training in place and he could learn some uh, skills of what he needed to be able to take part. So that was nice. Um, we, as a school, we've adopted the growth model in our work. So... That was formulated by Growth Coaching International, and it, it stands for goals, reality, options, wills, tactics, and habits. Uh, and that was the model that I was trained with initially. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been, it's quite easy to use. It's quite easy to understand. And, and people at the school are familiar with it as a kind of background model behind some of the yeah. coaching we use. So I think that was a real benefit of that. Um, in terms of how, how much I helped scaffold the conversations um what i did in the participant booklet is to 
to just give some sample questions for each different coaching point. Um, I, I, I didn't want to tell people how or exactly what questions to ask because I don't think I don't think that's particularly helpful. I think it was useful that people really listen carefully to the conversations and, and decided for themselves which way it should go. I think that's really good coaching, but it's it's equally useful that people have the support of some sample questions there to help them along the way if need be. And, and it seemed to work well. And that way they've kind of got the skeleton underneath haven't they without it being a script or a straight jacket because I think it can be ask these five questions it can just become rigid it can become not useful to the flow of the conversation it can become irrelevant maybe depending on the situation that you're in but for yeah. people who are less experienced maybe in coaching having the nudge of a few questions that they might adapt or that might emerge naturally in the conversation. And they think, oh, that's interesting. I did touch on that. It's helpful. It's that sense of underpinning the conversation with the depth of reflection that you get from really well-crafted coaching questions. So I can I can see the value of that. And the, the models. Sorry, gonna... Joanna. I, I didn't yeah. I didn't want people to feel like they had to do it a certain way. Yeah. I wanted people to have that freedom. And, and similarly, at times, if they if they sort of moved away from coaching and they just had a very casual conversation about it, I was comfortable with that. Mm. Coaching was really there to support the conversation. Yeah. Um, and at times, and you'll know this yourself, sometimes, you know, if you ask someone to give you your advice, that's really helpful as well. So yeah. um, if you were working with somebody and, and you weren't sure about how to do something, but they had an idea, then great, have that discussion. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's really healthy. That's, that's equally good, you know. Absolutely. So sharing practice, in fact, and sharing mm -hmm. personal insight might come into it as well as part of the conversation. Anything that's going to be useful in the service of that lesson and that practice developing for your colleague, I think, is, is, is really available and on the table. Mm. So thinking about benefits, what did you notice about the benefits of the model? What did your feedback tell you about what staff valued in that process? Yeah, um, good question. Probably the most important question really is, you know, what was the benefits for teachers using this or for teachers using this? Um, and I was really keen, as I say, to get some feedback that, uh, in terms of their overall thoughts of the process. And, and what I was really interested in was um, trying to find out, you know, what impact had it had on the learning of pupils, the learning experience and, and their own teaching and learning. Uh, and you can see on the left hand side that those those percentages are really healthy, which is which is nice to see, as well as the fact people would be happy to do it again. Yeah. So although this was a small pilot, that was confirmation for me that we're on to something. Yes. Um, on the right hand side, we've got some uh, some comments and quotes from people. And again, I, I was keen to find out, you know, how they felt about things and how they felt about coaching within the process. And I suppose as a a real kind of coaching buff and advocate. I love the second one there, um, which, you know, it gives us the time to think about teaching and learning and coaching pushed me to think more. And, that, uh, and that's not pushed in an aggressive sense. That's pushed in a, in a quietly supportive sense to help them think about things. And that was lovely, really great. Um, it made me dedicate time to reflect on what I do, which is fantastic because as you said earlier, you use the word having the space, and I think it does provide that space and that um, facility, that a way to do it, and, that, and that's fantastic. Yeah, really, really encouraged by those, and and again, that's given me the encouragement to have another go this year and see see how it takes us. It's really striking, I think, that people are noticing for themselves the effect of having some time and some space to think. And you can see that in the quotes. But you can also see this externality of, of thinking about them talking to the learners about what the learners thought about the lesson and seeing what people in other departments, maybe of the school, are, are doing in their practice. So the kind of balance of deep internal reflection with gaining things from connecting with others outside I think that's also a really interesting set of comments to see that this vehicle, this is a vehicle, can give you both of those different benefits, if you like, which is which is great to see, really encouraging. Yeah, and I, I think that was a very active decision that we made. I think in in meeting four before the half term, you know, we talked about how do we want to pair up with people, yeah. and it, it, you know, it would have been, I suppose, the most obvious way would have been to pair up with someone from your own department or faculty to want them a better term. Mm. We decided to go down the route of, of 
pairing up with people from completely different areas of the school. So you might have been an art teacher working with a biologist, a geography teacher working with a mathematician. And, and I really like that. And I think the other participants did because you then you get to see things from a different perspective, but it makes you realise the different thought process people have to go through within their own learning environment. Yeah. And within their own context and that was great so the decisions i make as a geography teacher whilst planning a lesson a classroom based lesson are different for those someone working in a lab or an art room for example yeah. for very obvious reasons it's also a different style of teaching and although there's some common ground mm -hmm. um it's just interesting to really hear how people work and and, and a wonderful thing i think people really enjoyed that yeah. um freedom to do that i think and variety, it's the variety, I think it's the different perspectives, it's the freshness of going to watch something that is not like your own yeah. practice in, and not even like your own subject. I think that there's like a really interesting professional thing there about getting out of your own hole, if you like, and going to look at how, how the world is in other classrooms. I think that's absolutely fascinating. And having that conversation to look at resources, to think about how colleagues plan because I think mm -hmm. the planning process is a fascinating one and we actually don't talk to each other enough to to externalise how we're doing that. What are we thinking about at different points in the planning to make the decisions and on which rationales are we basing those choices? So like plenty of opportunities to talk in really rich and interesting ways. I think with people from different subjects it doesn't need to be your own subject to get that rich depth. OK, fantastic. So let's move on and think a little bit about the glitches and the challenges and also what you learnt from developing this pilot. And, and then we'll think a little bit about the future and where you think you're going to take it. So first of all, glitches and challenges. What was tricky as you tried to put this into place? Yeah. Um, without a doubt, the hardest the hardest bit was trying to get people together um, in such a busy place to to discuss it and to work on things so trying to get people together for those meetings at the beginning and then uh that was the hardest bit because trying to get sort of six or eight people whatever it is at the time uh, with completely different timetables in completely the same place at completely the same time is, yeah. is is difficult but we did it and it just required a bit of to it and from here and there to be able to do it so i'm full of admiration for my colleagues um uh, determination to do that and to see it through that was really wonderful and you know very professional of them too so that was that was good did you um, go for live did you go for live meetings in the end or did you go yeah, for online yeah, or did you hybridize so have some people in a room and some people on the screen yeah we did a bit of that we we had some on screen and some <clears throat> in person if you Great. like but nothing was recorded we we tried to make sure each meeting was mm -hmm. um was uh, we wanted everyone to be there. I, um, I think that sometimes when you record things, you maybe don't get the same experience as when you are actually there in person. So that's the way we did it. And I, I, it seemed to work quite well. I would also, you know, if someone did have to miss it for some reason, I would just catch up with them later and, yeah. and spend time with them to make sure they, they, they got everything they needed. So that worked quite well. But that was, you know, undoubtedly the biggest challenge. Um, but I, I think, I think, a smaller challenge but which actually made this all a bit easier was at the beginning the time I spent with Erin Cullen Darcy from the teaching and learning group just thinking about how we can really plan this out so <clears throat> the challenge was getting the right structure and the right framework for our school um, because I, I'd imagine in every different institution it's going to be slightly different than yeah. what you do think just because totally of nature agree. beast so there was a real challenge there in trying to make it work for us but i think we i think we did that it's been much harder this year uh to get it working um but we have done the initial four meetings and about to embark on the planning and the teaching and the feedback stages now mm. so we're just running it across a different time period uh, initially, I thought, could would it be possible to do one cycle in the autumn term, one cycle in the spring term? This year, it looks like we're just going to be doing the one cycle across two terms, but that's fine. I think it's um, fine, God, because I think you'll get the depth, it and it's more it's more about being with the reality, isn't it? And I can see that. I think getting four meetings done in that first term, I'm thinking you actually you actually did well with all the challenges there are in getting a year up and running. To then have that the deep, the deep learning cycle and the experimentation in that second term. I think that could be really effective, actually, and then have reflection going forward. 
It could be. I think what I'll do, we'll have a meeting to stick, brush up on things again and then get going and that'll be wonderful. Yeah. I think I think another thing that I uh, found a challenge was, and this is something we discussed before, was, was knowing how much to ask of people um, because there are certain articles here and there I ask people to have a read over before a meeting or to mm. comment on after a meeting and so mm. on. Um, and, and I'm doing that really based on their own goodwill mm -hmm, <laughs> and mm -hmm. their willingness to take part. And um, it, it's it's trying to tread a fine line between, you know, asking too much of people and, and asking enough so that we get something from it. And I, I think that was, that's something I'm still juggling with, but we'll, we'll persevere. Learning points then, things that you've taken away from this experience of piloting what do you feel that you've learned that maybe you're now taking into the future? I suppose um, two, two ways of looking at this. There's one in terms of me as a participant. Yeah. And then uh, in terms of me as someone who had an overview of the whole thing. Um, as a participant, I was looking at, at differentiation for a small band of pupils. <clears throat> and it gave me a real opportunity to look at professional learning, read some decent stuff, uh, and then that in place for my classes so i i come out of that uh, feeling i can serve those pupils a lot better than i did before so that's a real positive mm -hmm. um with a greater overview of of modern uh modern professional learning and, and and books on that kind of thing so that was good i think as someone with an overview of the whole process um that's that's slightly slightly trickier I, I, if i'm honest i haven't cracked it yet i think that's the biggest thing i haven't learned i've learned sorry i haven't cracked it yet it's not perfect i don't know if it ever will be perfect i think there'll be some years when it runs more smoothly than others mm -hmm. um but i think i've just got to keep working with people to try and find a way to refine the systems we've got and the structures we've got to enable it to happen really um so i, I i've adjusted some of the booklets I put in place as a result of conversations I've had with people um, and that's been a really good thing and and again maybe in the future I can look at the dates a little bit more closely but it, it's just trying to I think we've got to be flexible and I think it's I think what I've learned is it's it's okay for it not to be perfect <laughs> and we've just got to uh, we've just got to go with it and run with it to some extent. What are the tweaks that you can see you've made this year? I'm just interested in what's different in the booklets and what might be different in the way the process works. Is there anything different at those two levels? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the booklets and the the stuff I've put up on online to be used, I think I've just tweaked some of the sample questions here and there, mm -hmm. um, just so that they were a little bit more education focused still very open mm -hmm. as they should be but just with a little bit more thought on uh teachers really i think yeah. um so I've, that's been useful um i also had included a kind of plan of a kind of time plan for things and that that was tweaked as well right. um but yeah just a, a few minor things like that but actually that should have a, an impact in a positive way um i think that that's been important yeah, they would be the main things. But I, it's one of those things, every time I, I pick it up and think about it, I'm, as a teacher does, I kind of yeah. think, oh, maybe we could do that differently next time. So. And explore different ways of, of, of the, using the model, maybe, with, and in different dynamics. I mean, I think there's a, there's a real value also in people within teams in the same curriculum area going through this process and thinking about what challenges are there within their cohort of students, within subjects and, and levels that they might be teaching within the department. There's a kind of interesting in-depth within your subject unseen observation model that could exist as well, I think, as an option. Yeah, no, no. That, 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 I think there's various ways that we could use this within school and, and it's a bit like the Gibbs model. It, it's like, um, it's just trying to find where it fits and where it's going to have maybe the most impact really and um, but yeah there are there are various opportunities to use it and what I like about it is when you do get things in place it runs pretty smoothly actually yeah I think it's that that's initial those initial bits of planning and structure once that's done the rest of it kind of takes care of itself absolutely so yeah. what's the evolution that you see can you see this so you're trying it this year across a, a kind of bigger time frame. So maybe across the two terms as the kind of mm. core structure. 
Are there any other evolutions where you think it may develop further? Yeah, I mean, I've always I've always wondered, you know, how easy will this be to upscale so that we can have more staff doing it? I, however, equally, you know, I know staff want to be involved in other things. They don't all want to do this, and that's completely right. It's their choice. I think as things stand right now, I could probably manage uh, 10 staff, maybe maximum, doing this right now. And that's fine. That's mm -hmm. decent percentage of the staff on site and stuff so uh, we'll see how that goes I think I'm looking into uh, I'm actually looking into piloting this term how we can use the model with a leadership slot mm. how it can be used to help school leaders or people with leadership responsibilities work at whatever level yeah and how we can use the model there to think about the way they do things across the year so that's quite exciting so i'm going to yeah. we're going to be piloting that um later this year uh and i'll be working with the rector to do that um so that'd be good and there's some heads of department who are keen to be involved in that so that'd be really interesting so is that is that going to be branched as unseen leadership then that's unseen leadership yeah it's a new exactly kid on the block is. i like that i, I mean it's <laughs> well, great you know, the space to, for, for leaders and managers to think about how they lead and manage, isn't it? I mean, it's such an opportunity to think about maybe how you're going to run an event or how you're going to deal with a new initiative or yeah. how you're how you're going to be briefing staff on a new strategy. There are all kinds of opportunities where leaders and managers could benefit from thinking it through with someone else, exactly doing it, it, it and reflecting on it. Exactly. It could be um, a head of department who wants to improve the way they run their meetings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a more senior leader who wants to, as you say, uh, run a project uh, yeah. across the year um, or, as you say, implement a policy. So there's lots of different ways that that can be done. So just finalising um, the resources for that before we get involved and we'll see who wants to be involved in it. And uh, it should be, yeah, should be interesting. And I, I kind of, my, I hope if that goes well, um, there'll be leaders at all levels in the future willing to take part because it, it could be the space they need to do yeah. some really positive thinking. Absolutely. So just two things quickly to finish on. Just a lovely overview from Martin Ellis from Guernsey Institute. When we were running a session, Matt O'Leary and myself, about the unseen observation model some years ago, she was taking notes of aspects that we were discussing around some of the benefits of unseen observation. So I just thought I'd share her fantastic graphic summary there of the benefits that we we were discussing and that people were talking about and sharing around around this whole model. So I'm just really delighted that, that we've managed to find time down today to really think about how you've done it, what you've learned so far and the potential for evolving it, which I think is, is really interesting insight for other people to then consider as they start to explore this in their own settings. So finally, just um, for people who might be reading or watching, further reading, I think some links on the screen that we'll also put onto my blog page as well for people to look at related to unseen observation in its various existences in different sectors. Anything particularly that you'd you'd flag for people to look at? Any any particular models, resources, websites that you think are interesting around either the reflection, Dan, or or the model itself? Anything that, that's really been helpful? Yeah, you? I can um well I'll do, I'll 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 give you the links of those websites to do with self-reflection that I right. think they'd be really useful to put on there for people if they like them. Uh, very straightforward, but gives you everything you need to know. Um, and then this, these ones here, your the one you, you've got there with uh, what are the potential benefits of unseen observation? That was one I asked all the participants to read prior to getting involved. So just to check that they wanted to do that, that was really helpful as well because that just gave me a, um, a, a taster of what was to come. Really, so I think that was a good starting point for them. Yeah. Super, thank you. So thank you so much for sharing everything today. I hope that's been an interesting kind of reflective space for you as well. And we'll share all these resources online through Clip and through my blog site as well for people to look at. No problem. I've enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Dan.